Welcome back to Swix Classroom. Today I want to talk about seven things I learned from teaching an entire semester of elementary music online. In no particular order, here are the seven things I learned. Number one, the music lesson is just a vehicle to make a connection with the students. When I first started this semester, I built a 20 minute lesson to fill my 20 minute slot because I thought I need to express as much information as possible in my 20 minutes of time. We have so much to talk about in so little time. If you look back at my virtual lessons, you will see they went 19 minutes and 30 seconds or 21 minutes. I thought I'll just start a minute early, I'll keep them a minute late. And eventually, and you'll see as they go on, they get a little bit shorter and a little bit shorter, and eventually it turned into the whole lesson revolved around maybe a 12 minute idea. Because I learned the students, whenever they interacted, I viewed it as a situation where they were slowing me down. If a student had a question, or if they said something was difficult and we needed to review, I was angry with myself that we were losing time. And so I learned to reapproach the lesson as 12 minutes of content with more like eight minutes of interaction in between. And even if a lesson ended early, it was so easy to fill the time by just asking questions like, how are you doing? What's something awesome you did recently? Or does anyone want to demonstrate how they can play the lesson by themselves? So I definitely learned I was a happier teacher teaching less content in a smaller amount of time because the students interacted more and then I felt like we weren't rushing to the end. Number two, versatility on the instruments I have available to me in the classroom. So in this room, I have an electric keyboard, a ukulele, and a vibraphone. And I thought this was enough to maybe portray all the things I need in class. Uh, I love to improvise songs, so if a student says something interesting, maybe makes me laugh, I'll make up a song about it. And I love to use the ukulele, because I think it's easier to improvise using my left hand to make the chords. But the piano provides its own greatness also. So if a student tells me it's their birthday, I can go over here. Or if they tell me of a loose tooth, I can go, he has a loose tooth, he has a loose tooth, and jump around just like that. Which leads me to number three. Number three, make a big deal out of normal interactions. Loose teeth and birthdays and holidays that our students celebrate, it's important to make sure they're still as big of a deal as they were in person. My first hint that loose teeth were important was when I had a student tell me that they had a wiggly tooth, so I pulled out my ukulele, and I said something silly like, Johnny has a loose tooth, maybe you do too. Johnny has a loose tooth, maybe he has too. And the students start laughing and having a good time. And mind you, this is kindergarten, first grade. But because I took the time to make up that song, the student felt noticed. And then other people felt like it was time to come forward when they had loose teeth. And if the tooth fell out, it became this new daily update of who has wiggly teeth and whose teeth fell out and show me your missing teeth. And it was a fun way to get class started because then students had something to talk about immediately. Now granted, this is the younger grades, but still, it was a great way to get everyone talking quick and also get their cameras on to show their teeth. Number four, a little bit more on a serious note, having a diverse way for students to participate. What I found out is that students are in completely different situations. Some are at home, some are at a friend's house, some are at a learning center, and if you don't have those, it's basically like a room with cubicles where students learn like a daycare, but it's kind of more like an office. Uh, and then daycare, some students are literally at a daycare. And when I have an activity that says, okay, dance and be silly, the students that are in public have no interest in looking crazy in front of, you know, some of these people might be strangers. On the other hand, some friends are at home and they're all learning in the same room. Brother, sister, mom, dad, you know, even mom and dad's a teacher. They're teaching next to where a student's trying to learn. And if I say, okay, now sing this song or now play an instrument or get drumsticks and bang on something, it's not going to work out because the other person's trying to learn also. So I found that there has to be kind of a silent option a moving option, and then maybe a best of both worlds is an option where they can type or they can just tap on their keyboard. So having that ability of, if you want to, stand up and dance. If you don't want to dance, I need to see you playing on a pillow, something silent. And if you don't want to do that, I need you tapping on the keyboard and we'll have like our digital xylophone. I need you tapping on the digital xylophone where that's a very silent and not so external way to participate. Literally to play the keyboard, their hands are out of sight, you know, they don't have to be too emotional in their response, and they can just tap along on their keyboard. But having those options really opened up the doors where students who don't feel comfortable doing one thing or the other would really have a chance to participate regardless. 
Number five, and this really saved my whole curriculum, but the digital xylophone is so imperative to my program right now. To be able to go into my bag of songs that I would normally teach during the school day, uh, and if we were in person, and then say, okay, we're gonna repurpose these to have numbers on them, and you can tap the numbers on the keyboard to match the xylophone. And so I repurposed a bunch of my holiday songs to match, and then also just finding popular songs, or then quizzing the students, okay, what, what kind of melody can you come up with? And then we did small groups where I said, okay, I'll give you a minute to work on something, and then we're going to breakout rooms, and you're gonna perform for the people in your breakout room. And that was a fantastic lesson, and it was obviously a chance for them to play an instrument, for them to interact, and to also be seen, be heard, which is a great thing. But the digital instruments were a huge part of my semester, and I recommend it for anybody. And now granted, there's a whole bunch of choices. I'll put my favorite in the link below. It's the Scratch MIT Xylophone, and there's a bunch of them actually out there. This is just the one I like, honestly, because it was the one I found first, but there's some variations on this one. And I even tried myself to make some interactive instruments on these YouTube videos, and I'll link those down below also, where I kind of tried to make, it wasn't as effective, but I was trying to make something where students could click around, but I found that the MIT Xylophone used the least amount of bandwidth of their internet, so once it was loaded, it was good, whereas my YouTube videos really kind of took up some of their internet. Even though I sing the praises of the digital Xylophone, it did create some new problems. For instance, students had to learn how to split screen, or I had to embed both files on a web browser, and I found that like Firefox didn't allow you to select one or the other, you were selecting both somehow. So I had to make sure students were using the Chrome web browser, which worked out okay so far uh, but there were some a few drawbacks and even technical difficulties when students are clicking back and forth between two windows sometimes they wouldn't have the window with the xylophone selected and then they tell me there's a problem and my solution is always to close the window and reopen it because it just solves all the problems but it happens almost daily where one or two children are saying like mine's broken and it's just a little bit of class but i'll still take like the 98 percent of students that are getting a chance to play their xylophone without any problems and i'll still fix that one I think that's way better than not having it all. Number six, staying active in the Facebook groups. There are huge Facebook groups where people are sharing content like crazy right now. I had no idea there's so many awesome creators out there who are making their own content. And me included, it's just a chance for us to really get our stuff seen. You know, a lot of times I create a video and it's just used for my students. It kind of stays in an inner circle of friends and neighbors. And now it's really cool that I'm getting comments from around the globe. People in Australia and India are reaching out saying, we use your lessons in school. And I'm like, whoa, that's insane. It's pretty awesome. But in those groups, there's such great discourse of asking questions and then people having opinions about what's the best practice for this and that. And I just find it to be so invaluable to get that many opinions in one spot, but also the content where people are creating play alongs. And honestly, the biggest takeaway I got was when I saw how popular the bounce along videos were. That's when I jumped on that boat finally and learned how to make a bouncing ball video where the ball, the ball bounces on the notes you're playing. But my students loved it, which is all that matters. And I love that I got that idea from the group and now I can forever make content just like that. Number seven and the biggest one for me is abandon the temporary mindset. When this started in the spring of 2020, we were told in our school district, it's a two week stay at home. So what did every teacher do? They prepared for two weeks. After two weeks, it didn't end. And as we all know, it went for the rest of the school year. If teachers had the opportunity to prepare for the rest of the school year, I guarantee it would have gone a lot different. So then they have all summer to figure out a plan and we're told, okay, we're gonna start the school year at a distance. So what do teachers prepare for? They prepare to just do the beginning of the school year at distance, whether it's how they set up their technology, how they print or copy their work, and for me, it was like, which instruments do I bring home? Because I only need a couple, I only get through us a month or two. So what instruments should I bring home from the building? And that kind of mindset of it's always temporary. And here we are, uh, we're probably gonna hit a full school year at home. And if we had known we'd been a whole school year at home, I would imagine we'd all change how we approach this. So as we're going into semester two for distance learning, and I know every school district's different, you might be hybrid, you might've gone back and now you're out and then you're in and you're out. But I would really approach whenever we go online as a permanent solution. You know, get your technology exactly the way you want it. Whether it's getting that extra stand, that extra light, or that better microphone, but just make it permanent for you because I know you'll enjoy it more. But on the back side of this, for the students, these days are permanently in their memory. And this is not a guilt trip by any means, but it's definitely a mindset of, in my career of teaching, this will just be a blip on the radar one day. Uh, but 
for the student, this will forever be how fourth grade went. And, you know, and for even worse, like fifth graders, eighth graders, seniors in high school, this is permanently their memory of how it went. And so I really, as a teacher, want to approach this as, how do I set this up as this is how I'm going to do it for, in theory, until the end of the school year. And I, I hate to think even further, but I've dug in, I'll say. I'm fully committed on this digital xylophone. I'm fully committed on the lighting situation, the microphones, and how I workflow. When I first got started, I made these large production 20 minute lessons and it just wasn't sustainable. You can look at all of my content and about after seven or eight weeks, I just got tired. I would spend every Sunday, Monday, Tuesday night, instead of spending time with my family, editing the lesson for the week. And I would go and teach Monday and go, oh, this didn't work. So I'd go home and or I'd <laughs> go home, whoops. So then Monday night, I would then spend editing what didn't work out of my lesson. I'd teach it on Tuesday and go, okay, well, this went better. And I'd add something to the lesson. And by Wednesday, it would be done. And then I'd have to start a new one the next Sunday night. And I was spending three out of my four days a week making a lesson. Now, on top of that, I, spent, I made those great lessons, but the data just didn't show that people were watching all 20 minutes. Students that were watching asynchronous were not watching the entire lesson. The data, unfortunately, shows it. The average watch times are abysmal. So I kind of learned that there was just a different approach needed for if a student's gonna permanently or all year long watch a music lesson asynchronously, it needs to match what they're capable of doing. And, not, and maybe not what capable, but what they're willing to do. Of course, they're capable of watching a 20 minute video, but unfortunately in this situation, maybe multiple teachers are expecting them to watch 20 minute videos. Again, I understand why I, I side with the teachers on this one, but if the student's only gonna watch three or four minutes, maybe my lesson needs to match that attention span and be three or four minutes. I say all of these things just to let you know, you've probably said the same things, and I just wanna echo that you're absolutely right. You're not alone. We're in this together, unfortunately. Uh, and if you haven't heard any of these things, hopefully it helps you in some way or the other to help you get through our future quarantine. Please comment below any ideas you think I left out. What are your favorite ways to engage students? What's your secret sauce? What product did you buy that you think is everything? I've linked a lot of the items that I use every single day down in the description. So if you want to check those out, but let me know if there's anything you have that you like to use. What's your magic thing? But anyway, I hope you're doing well and I'll talk to you soon.